One of the strange things about my office, and there's a lot, is that my office shares a wall with the communal kitchen. And because of that, right now, as I'm recording this episode of the Wasteland Podcast, I can smell that it smells like someone made pancakes. So I am currently salivating, and it's going to be really hard to talk about weight loss. And um, I, I do want to start this episode off with, first of all, thank you for listening or watching. Second of all, unfortunately, for the first time in almost a full year, I think it was like 43-something weeks, uh, forty it, over 40 weeks, I gained weight last week. I gained 0.4, um, but I, I, and I think I mentioned mentioned it on the last episode but I I know what I did. I went out with my girlfriend a couple times, and I just wasn't very strict. And also, um, something that we talk about a little bit in today's episode that really just, for me, helps is over the last couple months, I have to be honest, I got a little bit, um, what's the word, lazy about doing my fitness pal. And it's not, it, it's not like a laziness thing. It takes two minutes. Um, maybe it is laziness. It just, I, I wasn't doing my fitness pal, whatever, wh- however you want to describe it. I wasn't really entering my calories. I was checking them. And, and the thing is my, the, the excuse that I gave myself was that I eat pretty much the same thing on a continuous basis. I eat, I have a few different meals. I know what the calories are and I don't have to put them in, but it, you do it, it, Little by little, I would start getting a little bit too crazy with things, and uh, this past week, I've put my calories in my fitness pal, and lo and behold, the, the day before weigh-in, I've already lost weight for this week. So, I'm hopefully, knock on wood, go, did you hear that? I, I'm very superstitious about that. Knock on wood. Hopefully, this week, I will lose weight, and um, if you're if you're watching watching or listening to this in the future, you will be very proud of me, because last night was Halloween, and I'm not going to pretend like I didn't have candy. I had four pieces of candy and not the big ones, like the little mini bite-sized ones because my girlfriend has kids and I um, have no willpower. I, I I have a little bit, but first of all, did you know they had peanut butter Snickers now? I didn't. That is not – every time I go on a diet, they come out with things to tempt me to bring – every time I think I'm out, they pull me right back in. That's – a peanut butter Snickers, by the way, it was literally like, it wasn't even as big as a bite size. It was like a, a lick size and it was tremendous. Um, but I've already lost weight this week. I'm going to be really good tonight so I can continue that trend. But um, it was frustrating to gain weight. I'm not going to lie. And I think that it's a little also embarrassing and it would be easy for me to not talk about it or um, skip this week's episode, but it happens, and I think it happens to a lot of people, and for me to go almost a full year without gaining weight any week um, is surprising, to be honest, because I've, I've never done that before, and I think it's directly related to uh, to my Patreon and to, to you guys watching and listening, so th- <clears throat> thank you very much. Sorry, I got choked up there, um, but this week I have a very amazing guest for you I'm very thrilled to have her on um, and it's a actual real life doctor it's Dr. Lisa Oldson O-L-D-S-O-N she uh, has a certificate how do you how do you pronounce it a board certification in obesity medicine she's been a doctor for a long time I think it's like over 20 years and Actually, yeah, uh, close to 30 years, and um, she specializes in obesity medicine. And we disagree on some things. She talks about um, not always recommending counting calories, and you know what? As I've said before on this podcast a ton of times, different things work for different people. Some people don't like counting calories. For me, it works. Um, But she is immensely qualified, very nice. Uh, I know a lot of people have anxiety when you're heavy about going to the doctor. She would be a doctor who I'd be happy to go to. Very, very uh, understanding, very friendly, uh, compassionate. You can tell that she cares what she does. And she has two websites that you can go to. Her uh, normal practice is Olson, O-L-D-S-O-N, medical.com. 
And then she also, when she talks about it in this episode, recently started uh, a more geared towards weight loss coaching website and smartweightlosscoaching.com. That's smartweightlosscoaching.com. And she goes one-on-one with you and helps you figure out and build a plan. And it's, uh, I, I, I know it's not going to be for everyone. It's not everyone wants to spend money on it, but if you've had trouble, invest in yourself. So I'm very thrilled that Dr. Oldson came on. I almost said Lisa. She's, she worked too hard to just be Lisa. I'm very excited that Dr. Oldson came on. Whether or not you go to her website, I think that this, uh, we talked for almost an hour and very smart, very kind, and uh, I'm just so thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Lisa Oldson. I would just love to, because I, I, I'm i excited to have someone with your expertise, if you could um, explain your background a little bit. Sure, I'd love to. Thank you. So um, I started my career in primary care as an internal medicine specialist, where basically I was just playing whack-a-mole, like trying to stomp out for the most part, conditions and situations related to weight. And so, you know, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, uh, things like depression are seen more in people who carry excess weight. So I'm not saying that the weight causes that, but there's some correlation there. 13 different kinds of cancer um, have weight as a risk factor, Um, sleep apnea, arthritis, all the things. And so basically, I got a little tired of just treating the end disease issues because it was very clear if I could help people lose significant weight and keep it off, which I would love to talk to you about that because you're so far on your journey. You should, we should chat about that. I would love to, of course. Yeah, let's do that. So anyway, um, if I could just help people lose weight and keep it off, I could either prevent some of these conditions or treat them, improve them, make the parameters better. So I have been doing that now for almost a decade, just weight loss. And it is so much fun because I'm really not into that diety culture. I don't have people restrict. I'm very lazy about weight management because I think If we can't make it easy, if we can't make it enjoyable along the way, then who's going to stick with it for the rest of their lives? Almost no one. I mean, you probably actually know the actual numbers. I just know from personal experience that it's it's very hard if if it's not something like I've done. I've tried every diet and it works for a little bit, but then eventually you you go crazy and just run to McDonald's. It's it's hard to (laughs) it's hard to maintain if you don't actually like the food. Right. Exactly. What I think of, like when I think of running to McDonald's, I imagine, I've heard it described, like imagine you're pushing a beach ball under the water. That's what restricting is. Like if you want McDonald's, it's like pushing a beach ball under the water, pushing, 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 resisting McDonald's, and then boom, explosion. The beach ball pops up and McDonald's pops up. And that's that, what it's like. I, I would agree. That's, I mean, it's, it's for me, it was always, cause I've, I've, been doing this my whole life it would get to a point where I would get frustrated either about the food I couldn't eat but more mostly it was like I would get I would I would do well do well lose some weight lose some weight and then the first sign of a plateau mm-hmm. or um, just frankly getting sick of dieting yeah that it, w- it would it would be it would be out of frustration but well nothing's gonna change anyways right Right. And that's one, you know, that is something that I think is so interesting about your journey is you've come such a long way. You've lost so much weight. You're going to get into that harder territory where the scale's not moving, things aren't changing, plateaus last longer, or in maintenance where you're putting in just as much effort just for the scale to stay the same or approximately the same. And it takes like a whole nother skill set to manage that. Right. I, uh, I, it definitely has slowed down. Um, I wish it's always fun when you first start losing weight and you lose, like, I think I lost like literally five pounds in the first day. Um, <laughs> and it, it wow. was, uh, yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> oh, it was, it was great. Um, but 
it is frustrating. What I what I have enjoyed about um, this time actually doing it is I really feel like with the OMAD, with the one meal a day, that the only thing I'm really limiting myself on is dessert. Just it. Because and this happens every time I lose weight, but you start looking at what actually what calories actually are and the things you used to eat. So it's like, oh, I can't eat. I, I shouldn't eat. Not that I can't eat that, but I shouldn't eat it. Or I can eat. My my girlfriend calls my my, my favorite treat are uh, caramel rice cakes, and she calls them she calls them cardboard. Um, yeah. But I I <laughs> actually, good to me. no I actually like it. Well, I mean I like them compared obviously to, to Reese's. They're not that great, but um, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Actually, I, I, since we're talking about it, let's uh, let's we we'll, might be jumping forward a little bit. But since you brought it up, what is your um, advice for someone going to to maintenance? Because I've never I've given up on diets, but I've never reached a point of like actual maintenance. And my my idea in my head is I'll just add three to 500 calories a day and, and maintain is, is it as simple as that? Or is there more to it? Yeah, it's so it is a different skill set for maintenance. So I kind of think the most important thing about managing your weight in maintenance is managing your brain, like how you how you talk to yourself. So like you gave some examples like ah, you know, it's not even working, like why bother? Um, so I think the way you talk to yourself in maintenance is really critical because for one thing, by the time you're in maintenance, most of the people who are going to see you and be like, oh my gosh, Lee, you look amazing. That's already happened and they're right, getting yeah. used to you, right? And so you're not getting all that external feedback. That's one thing. Also, your body is trying to compensate. It doesn't know your brain, your hypothalamus that's in charge of weight regulation does not know that you have been doing this on purpose. It thinks you're in the great Boston famine of 2021, right? It just thinks you're starving. And so our bodies are really uniquely suited to return us back to our previous weight. And they do it, you know, people always blame themselves. They're like, oh, I just got lazy or I got off track or, I stop paying attention. No, that's really not what's typically happening. What is happening is the brain is leveraging all of its different hormonal levers that it can pull to drive you back. So for example, when people lose a lot of weight, one of the first things that happens is their ghrelin starts to go up. And so ghrelin is what we call the hunger hormone. So you get more hungry as you lose weight and it that makes it harder right so in the beginning you probably weren't as hungry now you might be hungrier than you were another issue is your leptin decreases so leptin is like the opposite of the hunger hormone it's the satiety hormone it tells you when you've had enough when you have enough food stored up and you don't need to eat more you're fine so your leptin is going to decrease. And also sometimes our sensitivity to leptin um, can change. And so your brain is making you hungrier, making you less satisfied. There are all these other hormones, CCK, GLP-1, peptide YY, a whole bunch of different hormones that are going to change to make you want to eat more. And here's another one that I think is really interesting. Visual food cues become more appealing. So for example, we could put you at this weight in an MRI scanner and flash pictures of, I don't know, what did you like? Al's beef sandwiches. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, and fries or something. I love fries myself. So let's say there are images of Al's beef sandwiches and some fries and a Coke on a slide and you're watching those while you're in a functional MRI scanner and we're looking at your brain. Your brain is gonna light up like you're a crack addict seeing your dealer. It's like, woohoo, let's go, we want that. If we take someone else who's the exact same weight as you, but who's always been that weight, and we flash Al's beef sandwiches and fries and a Coke, 
they're, they might be like, yeah, that looks good. I could go for that. But they're not getting that intense desire, that urge and craving is much less. And so I'm not saying that, um, you know, the visual cues, the hormonal changes, the slowing of metabolism that we know happens with weight loss, all of these things, the increased impulsivity, all of these things bubble up when you've lost a lot of weight, but it's not hopeless, <laughs> not at all. Like there are still lots of things you could do, but one of the things is just being aware that it's gonna be a little harder actually in maintenance. And you know, we know that from seeing like people on the Biggest Loser TV show. These people, they know what to do. They're motivated. They've proven they know how to lose weight. They've got all the tools and all the support. They also are out there very publicly, which might really motivate them. Like, I don't want everyone to see that I lost all this weight and then regained it. I mean, they couldn't have more in their favor for maintenance. But when we study the people from the 2009 episode of The Biggest Loser, <laughs> which they have been studied and the information about it published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, when we look at these people, out of 14 contestants that year, 13 have regained weight. Many of them all the weight and passed it. But I think it's because we aren't addressing how you manage your thinking, manage your mind around. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm just interested because you were talking about how like the your brain wants you to or is is trying to like make you gain the weight back. And yeah. it it would does your brain really not know because I feel better that I've lost weight. I feel physically better. And but like so like your brain doesn't necessarily know that like oh this is good for him right so isn't that crazy like our brains are so amazing but this is one place where I think just evolutionarily when you look at the history of mankind famine and food scarcity has been the issue food abundance. And ultra processed foods filled with weight gain chemicals, that's a very new phenomenon. So we have not really evolved to resist that and to protect ourselves from that in the same way. So what is your advice? Because I, I, I talk with a lot of my guests about how going to a doctor, it, it can be tough when you're a big per, a mm -hmm. kid because like it, you don't want to traumatize them. But if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, is once you get big, you're almost more prone to continue getting bigger or like even if you lose weight to get big again. So that's right. It, what is your advice to parents out there to because what, what I'm hearing is that it's, it's very important, even more important than I even realized that to, to make sure that your kids don't get big. Right. So I will say, like, <laughs> I'm not a pediatrician, so I'm not the expert in this, but we do know you're 100% rightly that prevention is so much easier. Prevention of weight gain, not that it's easy, easier than weight loss, and certainly easier than weight loss maintenance, which is this whole other skill set. And so if I had to, the same advice I give to adults is relevant for children and for families, which is all calories are not created equal. So it doesn't matter what the calorie count of a food is. If it's laden with chemicals, we know that's a weight gain food. So for example, if I decide I want to have, um, you know, let's say I'm gonna have 200 calories of something as a snack, like a big, nice, generous snack. If I have 200 calories of Reese's Pieces, I think you mentioned that earlier. I love Reese's Pieces, oh yeah. Yeah, right? So if I have 200 calories of that, you have to believe it's gonna behave totally differently in my body than 200 calories of salmon. And we have evidence for that. So, and mm -hmm. In what way does it act differently? So here's what happens. 
we used to think like we used to believe that it was all about the calories so it was like this really easy math equation calories in and then we see what you use it up during the day and what you burn up what calories you take you know take out and then whatever is left at the end of the day just kind of gets dumped in fat storage and then as that fat storage gets bigger like that's what leads to weight gain so with that thinking the old unhelpful advice to just eat less and move more would simply suggest oh it's just like the opposite of that math equation so now burn more than you take in and you'll just pull it out of fat storage but it's way more complicated than that if it was that simple math equation just a calorie in versus calorie out then everyone would be skinny i think because we can all do that math but we know it's so much more complicated so what here's here are the factors that contribute first of all there are genetic factors there are stress factors when you're super stressed it's harder to lose weight or manage your weight your sleep matters if you're not getting enough sleep it's hard to manage your weight or not enough good quality sleep being active matters but i don't spend a lot of time in the weight loss phase talking to people about exercise i mean it's good to move your body and it's good to be active but that becomes a much more critical piece in maintenance so i'll come back to that in a minute but when we think about nutrition nutrition it is not the calories it's the composition of the food and so if you eat let's imagine that i stayed up really late last night i didn't get a good night's sleep and then i was like tossing and turning worrying about something i'm stressed out and then i'm running late for work and so on the way to work i just drive through McDonald's and get an egg McMuffin which is filled with lots of chemicals if you read the ingredient list it's pretty shocking and maybe i get um maybe in my coffee i have coffee mate french vanilla creamer which by the way is like the greatest job security for me if you want to lose weight just like cut out coffee mate french vanilla creamer <laughs> the world would be a better place so let's say i have the egg McMuffin and my coffee with uh french vanilla creamer my brain is going to take a look at that <laughs> i don't know if you can swear on this show <laughs> go for it yeah go. okay my brain's going to look at this shit show and be like all right you didn't sleep you're stressed out you're a big fat mess in your brain and now you're trying to fuel the body with an egg mcmuffin and coffee mate creamer forget it we can't even use this there's nothing nutritive here it just dumps that food into fat storage into the adipose tissue so then here's the really interesting thing you think you took in all these calories right and very briefly you feel satisfied but the brain fairly quickly realizes there's nothing nutritive here to run the business of the body we need some actual fuel so it drives up that ghrelin that hunger hormone to get you to go seek more food it's going to reduce your satiety hormone so you're less satisfied it's going to increase the appeal of the visual cues of food so suddenly your brain pulls all these levers to get you to go look for more food sooner so people who start their day the way i just described by 10 o'clock they're like I need something else. I'm not feeling like I need some more food. Why the brain has recognized it doesn't have anything of substance to fuel the body. It would be like if you put diet coke in your car's gas tank, you know, your car's going to run out of energy there and it needs something to fuel it. So then what happens is we go back and we eat more because what we've eaten is not high quality food. and so it's not fueling our body so people get hungrier sooner they get snacky they have increased urges and desires for food so if we simply could go backward get a better night's sleep do some stress management some meditation or you know talk to a therapist or talk to your best friend try to manage your stress mindfully eat you know have two eggs and a piece of whole grain toast with half an avocado on it and just put some milk or a little splash of cream in your coffee or I drink it plain with nothing in it 
Then you go out into the world, now you're fueled. And so those calories might be the same, but they're going to behave so differently in the body. Right. I don't, I don't think it's pushed back. The only thing I'll, I'll, I would ask is yeah. because I, I, when you, when you said earlier, like, um, if it was just calories in versus calories out, you think people would be skinny. And my only, cause when I started losing weight, I was mm-hmm. just, I was, and I still am pretty much just doing calories in versus calories out. What I've, what's adjusted for me is when I first started, I was eating, still eating sandwiches and eating a lot of uh, chips, but just, you know, focusing on the actual calories. And I did feel hungrier. And because of that, throughout the past almost year, I went down from having bread to having rice to now I have cauliflower rice because I get to eat more of it and I feel fuller. Yeah. But my, I guess my question would be is if, if someone – had the egg McMuffin and the coffee with the creamer versus the other breakfast, mm-hmm. but they just they were able to avoid the the actual snacking that happens when you only have the egg McMuffin. They mm-hmm. would still lose. It would still act the same way. It's just it's not the issue is more mental where it's, you don't feel as full, so you eat stuff you wouldn't eat if you ate the better breakfast and and you felt fuller. It's better for that's why it's better for weight loss. Is that correct? Yeah. So, you know, then that person's in the position of pushing down the beach ball, right? I'm hungry. I want something. I can't. I'm not allowed to. I shouldn't. Like all of that is going to lead to feeling restricted. That beach ball is going to bounce up out of the water and eventually, you know, something's got to give you go and eat off track. So I think it's always a question of instead of what? So if you said that person is eating an egg McMuffin and having coffee mate creamer instead of, you know, two egg McMuffins. I, I was know, just going like to say yeah, two or three. Or yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like it's all relative. So you could. Yes, it's true that for the short term calorie restriction alone if you didn't change anything about what you ate all you did was just eat fewer calories that'll work for a while that's absolutely true but i think the better thing like look at you're eating your cauliflower rice are you like how's that feeling in your body oh it it, i i it it feels better it doesn't taste better it it feel i i know it's good for the vegetables and it it I, I it it feels good. I definitely feel fuller longer, and there are benefits like that. Um, do I, I and I could eat rice, but it's I I guess and this is I guess a good way to get into it. Uh, the issue that I have is I'm I get a little bit obsessed with the number on the scale during weight loss, yeah. and yeah. part of the reason like that that I made that I found the cauliflower rice and made the switch is I found that actual rice was just sitting in my stomach for too long and I knew I lost weight but it just it wasn't leaving Mm -hmm. and and I how do you deal with that with 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 your patients of like yeah okay I'm eating right I know I'm eating right but I just haven't like I I haven't gone to the bathroom or I drank a lot of water or whatever whatever it is and not being as focused on that number Okay. So I think everyone has to start, like anyone listening to your podcast right now should take out a piece of paper and a pen or pull out their phone, get on the notes section and start making a list of the non-scale victories. Like what feels better? You can walk into a regular store and buy clothes off the rack that fit you. You can take a walk and your knees and ankles don't hurt. You don't need to, you know, ask for a seatbelt extender on an airplane you, you know, whatever the things are, you sleep better, you're not snoring as much, whatever the things are, these non-scale victories need to be, you have to capture them to sustain you during the weight loss drought, because almost nobody goes down like that on their scale. Like here's where I started and it's all the way down in a straight linear fashion. There's a lot of bumping up and down. There's some plateaus, like you'll eventually get there. But the people who get there, 
they increase their stress tolerance around a plateau. So if you know plateaus are going to happen, and here's how I'm gonna talk to myself when they happen. So you might say something like, all right, I've been at this same weight for three weeks, but I know I'm doing all the right things. And I'm just gonna be patient because I believe the way I'm eating is really healthy. And I'm taking walks, I'm being active. I know that I'm doing the right things and I'm not gonna throw in the towel just because my brain is a little freaked out that I'm losing weight. Just gonna be sure I'm eating, be sure I'm not overly restricted. Maybe there are a few things you can tweak, but it's simply just talking to yourself and saying, it's not true that this isn't working. This is working and it's normal to hit plateaus. And those can last for weeks. You could be at a plateau for two months. Now what, I'm, I'm in a uh, sort of a weird situation because I've lost weight a, a bunch of times in the past. Okay. But this time I have this podcast. And I also have a Patreon where people follow me and I take walks every day with them and I, I weigh in every once a week f with them. Um, and I've done this for almost 11 months and nice. only one week I didn't lose weight. And to me, the reason I think it is because I, I feel like I feel like I'd be letting people down if I like if I said, oh, I'm eating right, I'm doing everything right. But then I I either gain weight, which would be the worst or, or stay the same, which the one week I did stay the same. They were very supportive. But something that I've noticed um, on some Facebook groups is people will say, oh, I'm eating I'm counting calories. I'm 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 walking. They'll, they'll, they'll say they're doing things that like I'm not doing. They're like I'm eating just chicken and vegetables. I I a gallon of water a day. I'm working out six days a week, and I'm not losing weight. And in my head, I think they're either a lying or just not being not not uh, maybe not as like devious as like an active lie, but they're not being as honest with them. Like they're not maybe counting the calories or something. It, is that part of it? Is it like, is there, are plateaus well, all, avoidable? Yeah. So we're all really different and it also depends where you're starting from, right? So if you're starting from a place where breakfast is McDonald's and lunch is nachos and dinner is pizza, it's a different path. It's a different journey than if you're starting from a place where dinner is chicken and broccoli and a baked potato with butter and sour cream on it. You know, those are, those two people are going to have a different experience. Those two people might have different genetics. And so I never think any, like sometimes people come to see me and they're like, I'm just eating salad and chicken breasts and drinking water. And you know what? I can still help those people lose weight because there's always something, you know, there's always something you can tweak, but most of the time it's simply just hanging in there a little longer. I want to come back to something you said about like it, the community is so important. Like the people that are your support, you support them, they support you. If you have that, that is a big predictor of success. And the, the biggest predictor within any sort of, program is attendance. So the fact that you're showing up every week, you're weighing in, you're walking, you're talking with your people. But you said something, I feel like if I don't lose weight, I'm letting them down. Yeah, that, that is how I feel. So we have to let's dig into that for a second. Because almost certainly, it'll slow down for you the weight loss and almost certainly there'll be some plateau and at some point you'll be in maintenance. So when you think the thought, if I don't lose weight, I'm letting people down. I don't know what feeling that stirs up for you, but like if I think that thought, I would think like, um, I would feel pressure. I would feel scared. I would feel, um, you know, like I, I think pressure and scared is how I would feel. So when people are feeling pressured and scared, 
usually what results from that is like overeating or soothing themselves with food or over drinking or giving up. I mean, it doesn't tend to be the kind of self-talk that will help you in the long run. I mean, I'm not picking on your thought because we all have those thoughts. But so other thoughts are available. So for example, you could choose a thought like, I used to think if I didn't lose weight, I was letting people down. But I recognize sometimes that's part of the journey. And I can show people that I don't get discouraged. I still show up. I still weigh in. I'm still I'm still leading this team with my energy and enthusiasm and support, even when the scale is stuck for a while. That's how I show up. Then from that, you feel like confident and you feel determined and you feel hopeful. And when you have those kind of thoughts, you're a lot less likely to be like, this isn't working and give up. Oh, absolutely. And I I think because I have probably 60 ish pounds left that I'd like to lose. Um, And I'm I'm sure that over over the next six to eight months, however long it takes me to lose it, um, there will be more plateaus because I'm getting closer and closer. Um, but and I do feel pressure. I do, but I, for me, that's why I'm, I'm such a big fan of, 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 of OMAD because I do feel pressure and it does. I do. I weigh in on Tuesday. So basically Saturday through Monday night, I eat less than I do maybe Tuesday through Thursday. Um, mm-hmm. but to me, the knowing that I have people paying for the Patreon or listening to the podcast um, has been a big motivator to to not cheat or to not um, give up because I know that that I have to not answer for it. That's not like they're sitting there like they're going to yell at me, but it's been for me very helpful that. I, I know that I have someone because for me, if I if I'm just going to go to the gym, mm-hmm. I'm not going to go. But if I have mm-hmm. a trainer who's expecting me or if I have these friends who are expecting me to take four walks a week, whatever it is, and I don't go and they're going to ask me where I was, that's where I end up doing things. So yeah, I get that. I get that. And, you know, I just thought of something that's kind of the parallel to what you were saying in my life, which is. When I'm at the grocery store, it helps me to know I could, everyone in my community, all my friends know what I do for a living. If I bump into someone at the grocery store and my cart is filled with ultra processed foods, well, that's not going to feel really good. Oh, do you go, do you drive like an hour away to get pizza or exactly. something? Yeah. <laughs> I grocery shop in Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh my God. That, yeah, no that, that must be, is that tough for you to like, <laughs> if you go somewhere, like, do you ever have lunch with a, a patient or something and you, do you feel like, oh, I have to get something really healthy or you well, must enjoy think, eating healthy, but. You know, I do. And I wonder if you have this too, Lee, you get a little taste bud rehab, right? Where suddenly the healthy things start tasting better as you're eating less of some of the. It's Unhealthy weird. Stuff. People people always say that. Um, I am enjoying vegetables and like stuff more than I have in the past. Mm-hmm. Where my change hasn't happened is French fries still taste delicious. Candy still tastes great. Like I, I some people tell me, oh, I don't even crave. I still crave. And it's funny that you were talking earlier about the like the visual stimulus. I don't know how how much you're on Instagram. But Instagram knows what you like. So if you go to your explore page, it'll show you just that. Like 90% of what I look at now is food. And people think I'm crazy. (laughs) That's your brain. Yeah. That's your brain driving that because your brain knows you lost weight. But here's what I really think. You have to plan in things like candy and french fries. What you have to train your brain around is... I'm not impulsively eating that crap all the time, just whenever the urge hits me, like, oh, like shiny object or a dog with a squirrel, like Kit Kat bars. Yeah, exactly. Or french fries. Um, instead, you sort of curate your treats. So Halloween's coming up. I always have Kit Kats around Halloween. I'm not going to town on a bag of Kit Kats, but 
you know, that is a planned splurge for me. And if you plan, and when I go on vacation, I love French fries too. When I go on vacation, I always have at least one meal that has French fries. And so I think it's really critical that you're planning not only on special and once a year occasions, but like, you know, every week there can be a little tiny planned splurge or a little tiny treat. And when you plan it and you have it, then there's no shame. You're not feeling guilty. You're not feeling embarrassed. You're not feeling like you, you let your people down. It's just like, no, if I'm going to eat this way the rest of my life, there have to be some French fries. And what I'm going to decide is how often, how many, there's no reason to ever order the large fries. I'm going to order the smallest size fries. And maybe I'm going to have those once a month, or maybe, you know, maybe it's, I don't know what the right frequency is to keep losing weight the way you want. You learn that through experimenting, you know, right. maybe you can eat French fries once a week and still lose weight. Right. I, uh, yeah. I, I've been, I, I, there are certain things I avoid because I know that like, so for example, like Tuesdays are my weigh-in day and I, I love, I go and I go to the grocery store and I spend like an hour in there trying to pick, pick my, my little snacks and I'll look at things and be like, oh, I really want Oreos. But if I look at a thing of Oreos, I know that I'll most likely eat either the whole pack or a big portion of it. And that's 2,000 calories. And if I look at, I could eat an entire sleeve of rice cakes, which I'm not going to, for 700 calories. So it's just mm -hmm. I'm, I make choices like that. What I'm interested is in the people that you've helped um, lose weight and keep it off for a long time. I'm interested in the skin uh, removal surgery when I'm done because I already have some loose skin mm -hmm. but in my head my plan is and this is just by talking to nobody is my, <laughs> my, my plan is I wanted to get to where I want to get give myself a range and if I can keep that off for a year is that's when I feel like okay I'm I'm ready to look into the surgery how, how long to, to you if you saw a patient and they kept a, the weight off for a certain amount of time how long like how what to, what is that time that makes them more likely to keep succeeding mm -hmm. i think probably a, a year is too soon so i'm not saying you couldn't do it in a year but maybe a couple of years and then i think also just kind of looking at how it feels to you do you feel like you're in your groove you're not struggling against oreos you're not restricting you're adding in tons of healthy abundant delicious foods and planning your snacks and allowing yourself to have treats and when you're at a place where you think i could eat this way the rest of my life like this is pretty decent i've got some good balance here and hopefully you're being active because that we should talk about that is a really like exercise becomes super critical in maintenance. It's not that important for weight loss. I'm not saying it's not important for health. It's important for health, very, but for weight loss, that's in the kitchen or <laughs> on your right. phone what you order. Right. No, I have, I've definitely noticed that like that. And I, it's a mixture of, I just hate working out and be, but I am actually trying to prove a point. Uh, there were days when I was over 330 pounds that I would walk under a thousand steps. Mm -hmm. So, but for me doing three to four walks and maybe a one or two, and even those have gone down kettlebell workouts a week, it's barely like working out. I mean, walking for an hour is nice and I, it's good to be active, but it, I'm not, I'm not going to the gym. I'm not doing it. And I'm kind of trying to prove a, point because in my eyes I didn't get to be that big because I, oh I loved working out and I, I I to me that's where the um sustainability comes in is mm -hmm. I don't think I'm I don't I just don't think I'm gonna tr to train myself into loving working out I think I have to be a little bit more active but it's I I, I don't think I'm ever gonna be the person who loves working out I don't think you have to be. So the research is pretty clear on this, that you do not have to be doing hardcore exercise to lose weight. And you don't even have to do it to maintain weight loss, but the duration, the volume, sheer volume of movement in a day has to go up pretty dramatically in maintenance. 
So if you're eating the same when you or similar when you get to maintenance, you have to dial up the number of hours that you walk. And when you do the kettlebell workout, what that is doing for you is twofold. One, we know that with weight loss, metabolism declines. People have slower metabolism when they've lost weight. When you're doing any kind of resistance training, and it doesn't have to be a lot, doesn't have to be crazy, but some resistance training is going to attenuate or slow that rate of decline of metabolism. So you'll help your metabolism stay higher if you're doing a little bit of resistance training. I mean, what do I do for resistance training? I have five pound weights and I do planks. I mean, I do the easy peasy stuff. It doesn't have to be, you know, that you're in an, a hardcore gym doing deadlifts. It doesn't have to be that. The kettlebell is a great option. But the other thing that doing a little bit of resistance training does for you, besides keeping your metabolism up higher, is it transforms the what kind of weight you lose. So for all of us, when we lose weight, we lose fat and we lose muscle. And so it's about three, approximately three quarters fat and one quarter muscle when you're losing weight. If you're doing some kind of resistance training, you just lose less muscle and a lot, you know, you change the amount of fat you lose. You lose much more fat, you lose much less muscle. You just shift the portion. So I think what you're doing is great. I wanted to say something about the Amish community and exercise. Okay. Okay. So in the general U.S. population, the rate of obesity, which just means a BMI of 30 or higher, body mass index of 30 or higher, our rate is over 40% right now. Getting close to half the population has a body mass index over 30. In the Amish community, it's 4%. So it's one-tenth the rate in the Amish community. Those people are not on Pelotons. Those people are not running half marathons or doing triathlons. No, they're just moving all day long through their activities of daily living. They're carrying things, they're walking, they're riding a bicycle. I mean, it's just this everyday moving your body for transportation, not just, you know, like even just going to the grocery store and buying your food and carrying it home. If you live in a community where you could walk like that kind of movement, we call NEAT, N-E-A-T. It stands for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. That is more important than hopping on a Peloton or doing or going jogging. You never have to go jogging. You can lose all the weight you want and you can keep it off without jogging, but you're gonna have to probably just dial up the number of hours that you're walking, that you're being active. Counting your steps is a fun way to do that. I love uh, fitness trackers because I think the gamification of movement is pretty fun. So there's a kid's book called Fancy Nancy and for the Fancy Nancy Earth Day edition of the book, she, sat, she has this little saying that I always like to say in my family, less than a mile, bike in style. And so to me, that means if I have to go to the post office, I don't know, it's three quarters of a mile from my house, I'm just going to walk there. If I have to go to the grocery store and I'm getting two bags full or less of groceries, I'm going to try to walk there. And so you try to, meaning unless I'm in a time crunch, like, and I know most of us feel we're in a time crunch all the time, but to the degree that we can stop that, stop being in a time crunch and use those kinds of errands. If you wanna to get together with a friend, instead of going and sitting somewhere, go take a walk and that sort of thing. Uh, be like the Amish, channel your inner Amish guy. <laughs> I w and it's, I think you're right. And that's really interesting. That's so much smaller. Um, I'm just thinking of like, because I know, and, and I would love for you, Pete, you to tell um, everyone about um, the your website and the work that you do on that. But what would you do, like for me, eleven months ago? Like for example, I spent. I told you I spent uh, two months in Milwaukee, and I've spent a couple months uh, weeks there this year too. And I've stayed in the same hotel, and it's literally a seven or eight minute walk just across the street from a grocery store. Mm -hmm. And when I was there for two months at over 300 pounds, 
I literally never once, like it didn't even. I I saw people, other people at the hotel, coming back from the grocery store. I was like, what kind of animal would walk? There's a there's there's a Culver's in the parking lot, and I ha- we have Grubhub. Who's gonna yeah. do that? And then going back months later when I was um, losing weight, I did it almost every day. How that's awesome. How wow. do you? Well, I uh, thank you. How do you? Because I just I'm thinking about old me. If you if you mm-hmm. told me, well, just it's only a, qu- a quarter of a mile, just walk. Like, well, uh, I, there's no way I'm doing that. How, for mm-hmm. me, it was very helpful to have like the group where I would, I'm literally on Zoom talking with them as I'm walking because it just distracted me. Yeah. How, how do you yes. how do you get people to make that change? So one thing I like to do, I did this when in the beginning of the pandemic, my husband and I started drinking wine with dinner every night. We were acting like every night was Saturday night because we were home, everyone was home and there was nothing else going on. And that super quickly became a thing. So then I tapped into a strategy that I help people with, which I'm gonna explain in a moment, to help me get out of that habit. Like after three or four months, that habit felt very ingrained. So at the Mayo Clinic, they do some work where they get people to create mantras or choose labels for themselves. So I started choosing a label for myself that was, I'm someone who doesn't drink during the week. I'm someone who only drinks on weekends. So when it was a Tuesday night and my husband would say like, Lisa, you want a glass of wine? I'd say, no, thanks. And then I very quickly just say to myself, because I'm someone who doesn't drink during the week. I only drink on weekends. In fact, that was not true. I was someone who drank seven days a week at that moment. But I was practicing that label for myself. And so I think you don't have to be perfect. Another way I would talk to myself about it is I'm practicing not drinking during the week. So if I were thinking about going to the grocery store, like maybe it's hard on your knees to walk there and back. Maybe I would say, I'm practicing being someone who walks to the grocery store and takes an Uber back. I'm practicing being someone who doesn't order in on Grubhub more than once a week. I'm practicing being someone who looks at grocery shopping as a double win because I'm getting some healthier food and I'm getting my exercise, it's a it's a time saver for me. I'm doing both at once. So I think like choosing a label and being kind to yourself that you just say, I'm practicing. You don't have to be perfect. Right. Oh, well, that, that's uh, that's very helpful. And, and Lisa, um, Dr. Olson, I'll call you that. Uh, seems no, so call funny. me Lisa. Well, it's all good. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. I did want you to tell people about OlsonMedical.com because I was going through and you have – a lot of great um, things that you offer. And, and I just would love for people to know where they can find you and, and what they can do there. Oh, thanks so much. So, right, my medical practice is all on Zoom these days because of the pandemic. So it's oldsonmedical.com, O-L-D-S-O-N. I apologize. No, you said it right. Okay, <laughs> okay, good. Okay. <laughs> but most people don't hear the D. Right. So um, oldsonmedical.com. But... I'm super excited because in addition to what I offer on my medical site, I really am trying to get away from always medicalizing weight loss. I mean, it is a chronic progressive medical condition for many people, but there's a whole other way we can think about it. And it's not true that everyone, it's like everyone who drinks does not have alcoholism. Some people who drink have alcoholism and we treat that like a disease with you know no shame no stigma but we treat it differently than someone who's over drinking and you know maybe needs to pull back but they don't have a chronic progressive disease so anyway i think by the time this podcast is live smartweightlosscoaching.com will also be live where i'm going to have classes and all sorts of other fun things for people who don't necessarily need one-on-one help with a physician to manage their weight so smartweightlosscoaching.com that is uh, going live in the next couple of days. So I'm super well, excited about congrats, that. Congrats. So I'll, I'll hold off. Is it coming out in uh, in October? Is that? Yeah, in okay. October. Okay, great. Yeah. And and what what is the difference? So 
What I'm doing differently is really in smartweightlosscoaching.com. I am tapping into the power of the brain. I mean, I'm not going to forget everything I know with my doctor hat on, but that is my weight loss coach hat that I'm wearing in that location on that website, in the courses, in all the different programming I'm going to offer through Smart Weight Loss Coaching, where I tap into, first of all, your brain, how smart you are. Like everybody knows that an apple is healthier than an apple pie. Like nobody needs that information. We all know the basics about nutrition. I have a little bit more science that I can share that sometimes surprises people that, um, you know, that I don't personally believe it's necessary to count calories. Don't think the science supports that we need to look at macros, like your percent fat and protein and all of that, because you can lose weight eating whatever combination of macros you want, or, you know, you can lose weight on lots of different types of diets, but this is just going to be more on managing your mind. How do you create new habits? How do you let go of old habits? What's the right mindset? What are the right strategies to help with weight loss and kind of step away from some of the medical uh, components of weight management? Well, that's awesome. I, I'm, I, I think that's great. And I think I, just for myself, I know I have a little bit of a, I don't know if a phobia is the right word, but there's some anxiety around going to a doctor when you know you're bigger and it's going to lead to some uncomfortable conversations. So I think that's really great. Um, so I will in the intro and outro, let people know when it's going. And so if you want to just email me or let me know when it's up, I'll, I'll make sure to release it after the website's up. Um, oh, thanks. But great. Of, course, of course. Thank you so much for coming on today. It was so great to meet you. If you ever want to shoot me questions, you know, you're going to get to that maintenance part. You just shoot me questions. I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Nice Thank meeting you, Lee. Take nice care. to meet you too. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Oldson for coming on the podcast. Again, that's oldsonmedical.com and smartweightlosscoaching.com. Check both of those websites out. Check out her social media. Let her know you heard her and saw her on the Waistline podcast. And thank you guys so much for coming on. I'll be back next week with a brand new Waistline podcast.